Students for Justice in Palestine chapters are among the many groups protesting in Chicago. Zachary Marshall is a PhD and a campus reform editor in chief. Joining me now with more, Zach, welcome back. Yeah, it's great to be here, thanks. Thank you. I, I was really surprised that the Democrats didn't send out some kind of listserv memo to all of their <laughs> splinter groups to tell them that they're looking for a unity, joy, joy, cuddly, twinkly eyed, she's the boss type of a DNC. And so they've had, I think, over 100 groups register and have authorization to protest around the DNC this week. And it's been a mess. There have been arrests. Yeah, and but the um, ironic part is, is that that's what brings these protesters joy. They love uh, protesting. They love burning the American flag, as we saw outside of the Israeli consulate. And they want and they enjoy the idea that they might be the ones to overturn Western civilization. So absolutely, this is all what the left has been about, both on campus and off campus. So on campus and off campus, let's let's talk about that a little bit. Um, yeah. School is starting back up. Uh, many parents over the past two weekends have dropped off college students, helped them move into apartments, all that good stuff. And it's always fun to do that because it's a new year. You're starting off, you know, for it, at, just like K through 12, you might have a new tech backpack or you've got new tech equipment, laptops, all that stuff. And so you head in and you're all bright eyed and bushy tailed about your new classes. You might be feeling a little bit wary. Maybe you have Diffy Q on, on board for this fall and you're terrified. You know, you know, you know you're you going to have a tutor. But whatever that is, you also now have to, many of these students, they're paying huge amounts in either student loan money or their parents are fronting these bills for these Ivy League educational institutions. And they have protesters on campus to greet them with their, they, with their shiny new equipment and they're meeting up with stinky protesters. Yeah, and I think the one thing we have to be very uh, cognizant of going into the fall semester is that this barrier between on campus and off campus that has been there for years is now completely gone. We are see seeing the same tactics um, in Chicago as we we're going to see in the fall, and that's because there are adults on campus with the tent encampments in the spring, and there are several Students for Justice in Palestine chapters in Chicago protesting now. In all cases, they start small and they escalate and they escalate and to see what they can get away with. And unfortunately for us as law-abiding Americans, President, you know, people like Munish uh, Shafiq, who just resigned from Columbia and her elk, they have been too weak and too um, out of their depth to handle these agitators. So what the problem we have right now is that we're going to head into the start of classes in about a week, and we are not seeing a single university really demonstrate to us ahead of time that they took the summer to do their homework and to actually beef up security and find a way to actually expel, um, suspend, or facilitate the arrest of these students. And that is the big worry right now. It is. And so if could we just possibly take a look at what the DNC did in preparation for their event this week. They actually called on the Chicago PD to dedicate battalions of police officers to line the streets to let the protesters know that they would be met toe to toe with absolute force from the Chicago Police Department. I think that's why the arrests have been low. The property damage has been really low. The expectation was that they were going to try to burn Chicago to the ground. And it's not been as violent as we thought because the, the DNC thought ahead and did exactly what you described there, Zach. Yeah, um, I do agree with that, but also we're seeing on the first day they bridged a barrier. On the second day, the protesters went out, burned the American flag at the Israeli consulate. So I expect this to escalate through the week. And it'll be fortunate if there's less violence than we anticipated. However, when you look at the people who control campuses, ultimately it's the board of trustees who are enabling these weak college presidents. And a lot of them are very much ingrained on the left. A majority of the Harvard board that kept close gain her position so long was connected to the Obama administration. And so when you have these leftist uh, board members who are too scared and too weak to tell their presidents, go ahead and call the police, we are not going to see the kind of security apparatus that we are fortunately seeing in sh Chicago. The last thing uh, Shafiq did before she resigned was float the idea that maybe we should allow Columbia uh, security officers to arrest students. Uh, that kind of crumbled her ability to keep um, the 
uh, a consensus for her among the board. And we're seeing the same type of thing happen at Rutgers and happen at Northwestern. At Northwestern, President Schill is pretty much relying on uh, support from a core uh, percentage of his uh, board to pretty much waffle and capitulate and negotiate away campus to uh, the tent encampments. Yeah, I, I think one point you made here, I especially would like to, you know, kind of grapple with a little bit more, Zach, and that is, you said, the differentiation, the it's an invisible barrier, but it exists and we all know about it. And that's the on campus versus off campus. On campus, you have campus security. Off campus, you have law enforcement. On campus, the head of school is the ultimate arbiter of everything. Off campus, you have various elected individuals mm -hmm. and you have a lot more autonomy, but you still have the rule of law. Um, mm -hmm. Students actually, they kind of relish the on-campus environment because it is a different place. It's a place where the students kind of, they have their own community and it, it's recognizable. There's a difference on campus. And um, for these protesters to be allowed to destroy that is really, it's one of the key tenets to the university environment that you know when you're on a university campus in America. Mm -hmm. Like there are very few campuses where you don't realize you're on their space because of the way it looks, because of the environment, because of the people who are walking around. They don't look like they're on their way to work. They're not dressed in business attire. They're students. Um, that that destruction of that norm, I think that's something that's really unfair to the students because it's a part of the university experience that they're having ripped away from them. Absolutely, you know, I've spoken to students, you know, especially one at Rutgers that said, you know, the encampment there um, last spring prevented me from taking the rest of my classes in the fall and exams were canceled. So my friends and I just, you know, went back home because there was nothing else to do. And, you know, campus reform is now tracking uh, young uh, Democratic Socialists of America's plan to do strikes and to walk out of classes. So we have this, you know, enraged scenario right now where you have a lot of law abiding, well intentioned students who want a good education paying almost $100,000 a year in some cases to go to college. And then you have a bunch of almost professional protesters at this point have their parents pay the same tuition, but then say, oh no, I'm not gonna go to class and I will hold the campus hostage. So no one can use the dining hall. So no one can use the library. Um, they pretty much are destroying a very expensive institution that's so key for future success for so many of their classmates, and it's really unfair to this generation because they are been they are so trapped uh, by their leaders' inability to get these uh, little kids under control. Yeah, little kids meaning adults who live off campus yeah. and aren't even getting an education. You right. know what, what strikes me about this is how similar it is to what we saw during COVID when they locked the country down and some of the teachers unions and, and some of the heads of school said they would not bring students back into the classroom and they forced them into remote environments. And private school parents really said, if you make your school remote, we won't pay, we won't bring students back. So it, it doesn't matter that we've already signed a contract committing to the fall, you're breaching that contract by making it remote. And parents wrote letters. My, We had a child in, in private school at the time. It was 65 parents, husband and wives with our name signed at the bottom of a letter that was sent. It was literally signed and then sent over to the head of school to say, this is 65 families with some of us with multiple children enrolled in your school. Um, so you you do the math, count out the families, count out the number of students and see if you can keep the doors open in the fall without this many families not coming back. And that that's just the beginning. It's early summer. We're sending you this letter to let you know if the doors aren't open, we don't care if you have masks or plexiglass screens, the doors have to be open and students have to be in your building in order for you to be paid. And if you don't do that, we'll take these kids and we'll put them in college because college is allowed dual enrollment. And, you know, lo and behold, they, we immediately received a letter back in less than five mm -hmm. business days saying that the doors would be open. All private schools opened up in the fall. These students are being subjected to the same weak leadership that we saw in public schools in K through 12 during COVID. And it's a travesty. Zach, campus reform, yeah. you're doing the heavy lifting here. We really appreciate your work and you coming on the show tonight. Thank you. Thank you.